All the time? God is good. Way to go, Kirsten. That's exactly what I've been teach, trying to teach you about right there. The man, it's good to be in the house of the Lord, amen? amen? Isn't it good when you find the peace of the Lord, when you know it's okay when your soul? I mean, a lot of stuff in our life will try to mess with us. A lot of stuff in our life will try to tell us we're jacked up. You know what? But there's moments when the Lord reveals to us and says, you know what? Settle down. I got your soul. I got you taken care of. So if you have your Bibles this morning, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to read there this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I want to share just a little exciting news with you. Y'all like exciting news? Uh, just, just to kind of let you in on this, we haven't really talked a whole lot about it lately. Of course, you guys know that we're part of what goes on in Anson, Bethel Assembly in Anson, Bethel Assembly in Albany as well. Uh, two churches that have we planted out of, out of uh, Anson. And the exciting news is this, and most of you know this, maybe you don't, but we are a part of Assemblies of God. I mean, if there's denominations. We're not big on denominations, but we are connected to the assemblies of God and uh, there's a hierarchy they've got a good governing system that looks over the churches and, and there's three districts in Texas we're part of the North Texas district and in the North Texas district alone there are 600 churches there's 600 churches and they have council once a year in June and which where all the churches get together and also they have national they have what they call general council and they look over all the Assemblies of God churches in the United States of America. And under the General Council umbrella, there are 13,500 churches, Assembly of God churches in the United States. And, and I'm telling you all this, I'll get to the point, but they meet annually, just like they do in our North Texas district. And this, this year, they're meeting in Anaheim, California. And uh, they, they come together and they celebrate and they, they focus and they hear from leaders and, and, and cast vision and all these kind of things. And on different days of the week, they celebrate some different things. And on Tuesday, they're going to be celebrating what they call rural churches. And that means anything below. We fall in the rural church, meaning we're not in the big city and we're not a mega church at this point. And so we're considered a rural church. And on Tuesday, they're going to give an award for the rural church planning pastor, pastor of the year, rural churches. And uh, the one that's going to get that is Cody Cochran from Anson, Texas. And the reason, that's cool. There, there, there are several things that, that the Assembly of God are big on. One of them is missions, fulfilling the, fulfilling the Great Commission. The other one is on planning churches. They have a vision for a healthy church in every community. And so it's just cool. Uh, Cody is going to get recognized, but I'm telling you this because without you guys, uh, he wouldn't be getting a, an award or recognized for being a, a planning pastor. And that's cool because what that means is whether people around here recognize it or not, people outside, way outside, recognize God moving through Bethel Assembly. And so we get to be a part of that, and we pray that this is just the beginning of going forward what God's going to continue to do to reach out to other people. So just wanted to share that with you, what you're a part of. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we're going to begin reading in verse 14 this morning. It says this, it says, For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, so that we might... So that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet we now we know him in this way no longer. Therefore, somebody say therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, 
We are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who had no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Pray with me. Father, we love you. We thank you for this day. God, we thank you that when nobody else loved us, that we loved us. Lord, the world tries to tell us so many things, but Lord, I just speak a new word in this place. Even it may be familiar, but God, I pray by your Holy Spirit that it's new today, that you would draw us in, that you would touch us, that you would change us, that you would begin to change our focus, God. Help us to walk as children of God. Help us to accept your calling and let us know that in your presence it is well with our soul. We love you. Have your way in this service. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. So I wasn't here last week, and I know that Kirk did a great job. Did Kirk do a great job? Amen. See, that's way better than you said you did. But I've been thinking about, since then, I've been thinking about kind of where we were going to go, what I was going to talk about today, and I just keep thinking about the, the day we had baptisms two weeks ago. That was an awesome day, amen. It's an awesome day when we get to, when, for me, when we get to, not just to see people do things, but when we see people uh, in obedience step into the kingdom of God. Step in and say, you know what, I'm going to follow. I'm not just going to go according to, to be good or whatever, but I actually want to follow God. When we see people step into what God's asking us to do and following Him, it's an awesome thing when we see God or when I see God moving on other people and people willing to, to respond to it because we all hear about God but many of us we never respond to it when we see people and hopefully when we see a, a baptism it's not just well that's cool and good for them but hopefully it reminds all of us of God's calling on our life to follow him to do something to step out of the boat to step in to the way that he's leading us when when I think about uh, people experiencing the Lord in new ways and and I begin to think about the possibilities for us as children of God amen that it's exciting and we begin to think about the destiny uh, the great things that he may have in store I begin to think about Jeremiah 29 11 that many of us know when God says for I know the plans that I have for you Bethel, I know the plans that I have for you, Philip, put your name in the blank. Plans to prosper you and not harm you, to give you a hope and a future. I think of the plans that God has for us that it says in 1 Corinthians 9. that says, eye has not seen and ear has not heard and neither has entered into the heart of man the things I have prepared for those who believe. I think about uh, the possibilities for Bethel and really the, what, we, what, what, what it could turn into. But I'm also aware of this. I'm aware of the struggle. I'm aware of the struggle, if we'll be honest, to get to our destiny, to get to those things that God begins to reveal to us in our mind. Because the truth is this, we start off on fire and we have these moments on certain, certain services or certain experiences and, and we're on fire, man. I'm different, I'm changed, I'm going to set the world on fire but then all of a sudden things don't easily happen and 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 we start off on fire and all of a sudden the world hits me and satan hits me and stuff in life hits me and all of a sudden i begin to shrink back i begin to get my fire quenched because we know that the world's a fallen world and it's not easy and things happen that are not fair and they're they're not easy and we deal with them and then there's this enemy Satan who hates us and when he starts stepping out he's going to come nipping at your heels and try to shut you down. John 10.10 10, we all know he comes to steal, kill and destroy in 1 Peter 5.8 he's the one that roams around looking, looking at you for the moment that he can devour you to kill what God's doing in your life and when these things happen like many others we've all been guilty of it I'm sure we shrink back a little bit at the very least we flatline and we just start going through the motions and we have no action we're not living our faith and you know what Paul was aware of these same things as he penned this letter to the Corinthians and in verse 14 he says this for the love of Christ compels me it controls us he's saying this I can't stay like I was I can't sit and do nothing in response to what Jesus did for me God's love through Christ, he's saying, it won't leave me alone. It won't let me continue living the way I've been living. He goes on, he says, we've concluded that Christ died for everyone. Isn't that good news? Christ died for everyone. But you know what that means? It's beyond just us. It's for everyone. 
It's for those people that you work with. It's for those people that you don't like. It's for those people that you don't get along with. He died for them. He said, I'm compelled. I'm controlled by. He was saying this, there's something in me that drives me, that leads me, that pushes me, that's bigger than me. This is not my idea. I would ask you to consider, I want to ask you a question. What drives you? Why do you do what you do? Is it just you or is it something bigger than you? Because here's the thing, we can all do us, right? I'm just going to do me. And we can all just do what we want to do, but at the end of all of this, that's exactly what it's going to be. It's going to be just you. You see, and we, we look at a relationship or a marriage, and one of us is always making it about me, and this is what I'm going to do, and this is what I want to want, and this is how you ought to serve me, and this is how you ought to make me feel good, and this is how you ought to tend to my stuff. And sooner or later, it's going to be just them. We're going to be all alone. And the reality is this, God has much bigger than for us just to end up making about us and us being stuck with just me at the end of all of it. Amen? He's got much bigger than this. You see, when we come to Christ, it's no longer about us. It begins to be a shift in our life. When we begin to grow and mature and He begins to change in us, we see that I can't follow Christ and stay selfish and make everything about me. Verse 15, it says, Christ died for all so that those who live or accept him should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and was raised again. That's what we do when we say baptism. We're baptizing. We're being baptized. I'm following Jesus, Romans 6, 4, in death to self, being buried with Christ in baptism. I'm following him so that I'm raised again in newness of life. And this new life is not about me. It's about Jesus. See, I don't know about you, but I know where my life, for all the years when I was making about me and what I wanted to do and what I wanted to achieve and what I wanted to be, it led me nowhere, man. It led me to destruction and loneliness and agony and a hole in my life that I could never fill. But when the Lord calls us, the difference is it's no longer about me, but it's about everyone else. You know why it sets you free when you get saved? Part of the reason is because it takes the focus off you and starts placing it on other people. A lot of us would have a lot less ulcers if we'd quit worrying about ourselves all the time and start focusing on other people. We see we, we, we need a little bit of a vision change. We need a little bit of a shift in the way we see things. He describes it like this in verse 16. It says, we no longer look at anyone according to the flesh or with a worldly view. We once did this with even Christ, but we no longer do because we see that the world and the flesh had no hold on Jesus. What he's saying is this, man, we don't look at anybody according to the natural. He said we even did this with Jesus. When Jesus was here, we just looked at him like another man, but now we see that he's defeated everything, that it had no hold on him. And he's saying this, we're no longer going to look at anyone else with, with, in this frame of mind, that's why Paul would go to the Jews and he would go to the ones who arrested him and whatever else and share the gospel with them. Because he says, I'm not looking at you in the physical, but I'm looking beyond that. I'm looking with the eyes of Jesus. See, here's, here's what point I want to make on this. You and I, people, we have to remove worldly, judgmental view of others and of ourselves. Think about it. When you see somebody, when you meet somebody for the first time, what do you do? You immediately form some kind of judgment about them. By the way they look, by the way they dress, by the way they talk, whatever. We immediately form some kind of judgment. And the problem is that many times because we form this judgment, we can't reach them with the message of Christ because we've already formed this thing because my vision is tainted. And the, the thing is we do the same thing with ourselves. Do we not? How do you view yourself? When you honestly look at yourself in the mirror, do you see yourself as a, I am a child of God, no longer a slave of fear, no longer any of these things, the labels the world's put on me? Do, do I see that or do I see me? Do I see the old me? Do I see the mistakes I've been through? Do I see the troubles that I'm having? And I keep focusing and it's, it's tainted my vision and I don't see me walking in the freedom that God's called me to walk in. See, so many of us, all of us probably, we see through the lens, lenses of this world. 
according to what I've been through, according to what I've heard on CNN or, or whatever the case may be. I, I see the world through a lens of things that I've experienced instead of seeing through the eyes of God. See, we have to learn how to be transformed. One of my favorite scriptures is Romans 12, 2. It says, no longer conform to the pattern of this world. Quit acting like it, quit listening to the lie, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, we have been conformed by the things I've experienced. I've been conformed by everything I've been through, everything I've seen, and so it's taught me a certain way of thinking. We have to be reprogrammed. We have to be retrained in the way we think. Thinking in the faith realm, thinking on things of God, not things that are seen, but the unseen. Because these seen things are going to, they're temporary, and they're going to keep us from walking in the greater things of God. Listen to me. If Christ died for us and we've accepted it, we have to learn to let the old stuff go. We need to let the old mistakes go. We need to let the old habits go. We need to let the old negative way of thinking, the old worry wart mentality. We have to let this stuff go and begin to think on new things. Think the way the Lord thinks of us. Because it keeps us, if we don't, it keeps us from prog progressing and becoming who God's called us to be. Because I'm always still dragging this thing around. And I'm always still looking at people through this old lens of something that I've experienced in the past, Paul knew this full well. Paul knew it. Because think about Paul. He was a man who, who thought he was something at one time. A religious leader, a Pharisee. And he was actually killing Christians. But after he gets saved and after he encounters Jesus and after he's baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit, he is now giving his entire life, giving everything he has for this this great message that he knows the world needs to hear. Do you know the world needs to hear the message that you have? The good news, that Je what Jesus has done? So Paul knew this. He knew it himself. It was true then, and it's true now. And so he lays it out in this famous scripture that you all know, or you need to know. If you don't have it, you ought to write it down. You ought to write it on your forehead. You ought to tattoo it. Don't get a tattoo and say, I told you to. But I'm just saying, it's this important. Because the enemy lies to us over and over on a daily basis, thinking we are this or we're that or we have to have this and we need this scripture. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone, don't matter how funny looking you are, don't matter how messed up you've been, don't matter what color you are, don't matter what church you go to, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. He's new. The old stuff's got to go, and the new stuff is coming. He says, listen, man, all your life, things are going to be labeling you. All your life, your past is going to be biting at you. And he says, you have to know this. You're a new creation. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? If we had a conversation, and we talked about your life, and you meet Christ, and, we, and I say, can you believe that you're a new creation? We say amen, but for a lot of us, it's a hard thing to process. Am I really new? Am I really different? Has anything changed? Am I really forgiven? Am I really able to say no to what always got me in trouble? Can you see it? Can you see it? We can't if we're still thinking and acting and doing like we've, like we've always been. And again, I say this, the old ways keep us, the old ways and the old days are destructive for our life. And they keep us from the new stuff. Even good stuff. We get stuck in the past on how good it was back in the heyday, man. Well, they're pretty good if they're playing basketball now. But if they'd have seen us back in the late 80s, by God, we were a real basketball team. No, we have to let the old stuff go so that the new stuff can come. There's a better way of doing things. We can improve on what was good. Now we want it to be great, amen. We have to let the old stuff go, and it's always been a battle. That's why the Lord said in Isaiah 43, 18 and 19, he says, forget the former things. Let them go. Don't dwell on the past any longer. Get ready. I'm doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? Can you not see it? I will make a way in the wilderness. I will even make a river in the desert can we see it can you see it in your life when God says I want to do a new thing I want to heal relationships I want to use you potentially to share the message of Christ can you see it 
Because the enemy tries to keep us blinded, looking back, feeling guilty, looking at all the stuff in the world. We think, well, I could never do it. I can't do it. I'm not gifted. I'm not able. I don't know anything. We don't see well. And it reminds me of the scripture of Elisha. In 2 Kings chapter 6, Elisha is here and his servant gets up early one morning and he goes outside and he looks. And on the hill he sees all these, this army surrounding them. And he begins to freak out and he goes into Elisha and says, man, we're doomed, dude. They've got us surrounded. And Elisha said, settle down, bro. He said, those who are with us are more than those who are against us. He's like, say what? You're one of them Jesus freaks? What's wrong with you, man? And Elisha prays to the Lord and says, Lord, open his eyes so that he may see. And it says immediately his eyes were opened and he saw the chariots of God surrounding them. You see, a lot of times we think we're alone in this. And we think we can't do this and we can't be different because this is all I ever have known before. And we think I'm the only one. And we need to understand that we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses in the heavenly realms, man, that they're pulling for us, that they're fighting for us. If we will just keep going, man. But we have to get these earthly lenses off and understand the calling that God has on our life. A generation would grow up at, at, at 15 years old and get it in their heart that God's called me to lead worship. That God's called me to be a light on my basketball team. That God's called me to, to share forgiveness and not act like the other kids in school, man. God's called us. If we would get a hold of this before the world tells us for years and years that you suck, that your mom and dad were no good, so you're not going to be any good, and you're just going to have nothing really good to look for. No, we need a different way of thinking. Let us see. Let us be transformed. There's a new day. Somebody say new day. Say something. I'm telling you this today. You can wrestle with it. You can struggle with it. I'm not going into big depth on any of these points. But I'm telling you today that in Christ, you are a new creation. That this is a new day. This doesn't have to be the same as yesterday. This doesn't have to be the same church service that we've had for the last two weeks. This is a new day. God's doing a new thing. There's a new way that we can walk. We may not have could have done it last week, but this week, with the help of the Lord and help of the body of Christ, we can do it. We have to step out of the lie and step into the light. Listen, this is not from me. This is from God. Verse 18, Paul says, all of this is from God. All of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ, that we would know God as Father. And he gave us then the ministry of reconciliation. He's called you and I, not to just sit in here and come to church, like, well, I feel good because I went to church. No, he's committed to us to go and share this message, the message of reconciliation. God asking us to partner with him in his work. This is what the ministry he gave us. Sharing with other people. The world's looking for it. You know this? Everywhere you go, the world's looking for hope. The world's looking for an answer. The world's looking for a new program, a new plan, a new something that's going to give them their breakthrough. That's going to make them feel good. That's going to bless them. All this stuff. And can I tell you this? I know it doesn't make any sense, but th this is true. You have what they need. If you sit here today and you say, I am a child of God, then you have what the world needs. They need Jesus. I know it's simple. I know it don't make no sense. Hey, if it made sense, I wouldn't be here doing what I do. It makes no sense. But that's the reality. Colossians 1.27, one of my favorite scriptures. Paul says, listen, there's a mystery that they've been looking for for generations and generations, and they couldn't see it, and I'm revealing it to you today. Christ in you, somebody say me, Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is the hope, Christ in you, that you're carrying around as a child of God, that he forgives, that he heals, that he makes new, that he empowers us, that he gives us strength, that he, he does everything that we need, he does it, and he is living in us as children of God, but so many times, we can't see it. We want somebody else to tell us. We'll go miles and miles to hear somebody else that's supposedly been able to do this. And the whole time, we've got it in us, man. And we're hoarding it because we feel like I'm not good enough and I can't do what somebody else 
can do. And we have to begin to shift our vision and understand that what God did in us, he wants to do through us. He wants us to extend it and share it with someone else. And I'll tell you this, verse 19, I'll tell you. God in Christ is reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins against them. This is the message. God forgives you. God loves you. He made a way through Jesus. There's a new day, a new start. And I'll tell you, not everyone's going to accept it. Not everyone's going to be excited about it. Not everyone's going to thank you for sharing your heart with them. They're just not. Trust me. Hey, I went from years, in 1993, I surrendered my life to God. And for about three years, I would share what God had done. I didn't know very much, but I would just share about the the stuff I'd been through and how God had forgiven me and, and, and what God's calling was. And you know what? None of my friends, nobody I knew, they didn't want to hear squat, man. I used to go around rodeos and I'd talk to preachers and say, man, if I can ever do anything. They didn't want to hear nothing. Nobody wanted to hear anything. And you know what? It may be like that with you, but I'm just telling you this, that we just continue to do it. We're not doing it for man's approval. We're not doing it for any other reason, but we become like Paul. I am compelled to do this thing. I can't keep it to myself. I can't keep it quenched down or I'll become like Jeremiah. It'll be fire in my bones. It won't let me sleep at night. It won't give me peace. Man, I have to share with people. Amen? Are we like that? Do we see this? Most of us don't see ourselves this way. People often reject us, and this becomes a point of difficulty, and things aren't easy, and life's not easy, and this doesn't look like blessing, and I thought this was going to be about blessing me, and nobody wants what I'm offering. And again, we have to go back to verse 16 and take the worldly view out, and we know that as children of God, we're operating in faith and not being so affected by everything that's been dealt with me. Things are going to happen. It's gonna, life's just difficult, man. But I'm telling you, this stuff is eternal. What God's done in you and what he wants to sh- you to share with someone else. Because if we don't, we're going to continually be affected by the world. Every day. If I get up and every day I have a breakdown and my hay baler won't work. So I'm going to cuss God and I ain't going to share the gospel today because my life's difficult. Or because I can't go to every basketball game and do everything with my family. And I can't go to every event and every men's event and everything that I want to do. I'm going to get mad at God because life is difficult. See, we have this choice. Or we can just choose to say, you know what, I'm going to keep serving you. I'm going to keep doing the best I can because I understand that there's a battle. Amen? It's a battle. We're in this spiritual battle that many of us don't realize. And it's more than just whether I have a good day or not according to my standards. We must battle to hang on to what Christ has done in us and continue the transformation of becoming a new creation. We're a new creation instantaneously, but it takes time to walk this thing out and be transformed into an adult and a child of God. Amen? Does that make sense? Transformation, we're saved instantly, but it's a lifetime of walking out in faithfulness. Just understand this today, and I'm going to quit. You are new. Today, you may say, well, I've been saved for 48, but today you're new. Today, ask God to give me some new vision. Ask God to let me see because today is new. Because I understand that every day is a new day with the Lord. Amen? You're a new creation. The world's not. Your relationships are not situations that you face with or not they're not but you're new and so the way I look at situations is different the way I respond to situation is different the way I act and the way I react that's what's different see as a child of God I can't change everyone else I can't control everything God didn't give me that authority but I can control me And as a new creation, I'm responsible for me. And so I look at things different. I see things different. I act different. I react different. As a new child of God, we change the world. You do. You know how you change the world? Simply by being the new you. Don't be the old one. Be the old hussy that cussed everybody when they got a receipt wrong at Walmart or they cut her off. Or when they beat you at the roping. 
I handle it different because I'm new. And as I do this, I become an ambassador, what it says in verse 20. We are Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. How can we be an ambassador? I'm glad you asked. By being different. By being different. God's called us to be different than we were. You see, if you are consistently the new you, consistently, not for five minutes, not for two days a week, but if we are consistently new, people are going to start to take notice. Man, what's going on with y'all? There's something different about you because they're going to see that you're different than you were and you're different than they are and consistently over time, all of a sudden now people are going to want to know what's different, what's going on. This is an ambassador just by being different, just by being the new you that God's called you to be. And he goes on, he says, man, we, we beg you, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. It's this important, Paul says, man, this is my life. This is my heart. This is what I surrendered for. This is the message that Jesus gave me when I encountered him. And we're begging you to accept it. We're begging you. Because when you really accept it, when you really accept what it says in verse 21, that he made, who made no sin became sin for us. And when we really understand, When we really understand what he did for us, we're not going to be the same. When we really accept that he won't allow us to be. And then us having courage to continue to step in it. When we understand, it just reminds us what Jesus did for us. I'm done. Music team comes. The next few weeks, we're just going to, I just want to start challenging us to begin to shift. So many of us come to church, if we're honest about, well, is it cool? Do I like it? Does it make me feel good? Am I comfortable? And all that stuff's important because we live in this culture. But I want us to begin to, to shift from in here to out here. What God's doing in here so that I'll go outward. So that I'll begin to make this transition. I think we'll talk about again transition next week. Maybe more about the battle of our mind. But just how there, there has to be a transition. If we're ever going to get to what God's called us to be. Because here's the thing. God has great plans for you. God loves you. God adores you. And he's got plans for your life. But there is a gap between where I'm at and the plans that he has for us. And we as a church, as children of God, have to begin making progression to those plans. Or we're always going to fall short. Are we willing to make transition? So in closing, what drives your life? Just be honest with yourself this morning. What drives your life? What compels you? What controls you? Is it the Lord? Or is it something else? The Lord can be in the middle of everything you do, but sometimes we don't allow him. Sometimes we cut the Lord out. What drives you? What really pushes you? Is it of you or is it of God? What are you, how are you doing in your battle? If you understand the battle and you understand the calling and, 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 and you're in the middle of this battle, I just ask you, how, how are you in your battle today? Maybe you need to come and say, God, I need new strength. This is a new day. You've reminded me I've been losing the battle. I want to I get back going to where I need to be. How's your vision? How do you see? Can you see? Can you see the things of God? Because he tells us as children of God, we're born again, that we're able to see things of the kingdom, John 3. Maybe we need to come this morning and hear Elisha praying over us. Lord, open their eyes up. Lord, open their eyes up and let them see who's with us. Let them see the calling that you have. God reconciled you through Jesus. So we would walk. Me, you, Bethel. As an ambassador of God. An ambassador is a representative from one kingdom to the other. Have you answered the call? What's the Lord saying to you? We close in worship. As a child of God.
you need prayer this morning, I'll pray with you. Bring somebody to pray. What's the Lord saying to you? Father, we love you. I thank you for this day. I thank you for each one, man, woman, and child that's in this place. God, we thank you how you've revealed so much to us. And God, I just pray that you would continue to speak to us, God. Establish in us what you've done in us and at the same time begin to challenge us to share it with someone else. As we discover what it is to be loved, Father, empower us to love someone else. For those of us who have understood what it is to be forgiven, God, help us to share that forgiveness with someone who desperately needs it. Someone that, uh, some of us, God, that have found our hope in you. There's so many in our culture that have no hope, God. Empower us to share that hope. God, I just simply ask that you would move in this place as we close in worship. If we admit that we don't see, if we admit that we've lost our focus, God, I just pray that you that you'd encourage us to keep going, to keep following you, God. Have your way as we close in worship. In Jesus' name. is over castles and welcomes the day spills over buildings into the streets where orphans play and only you can see the good in broken things you took my heart of stone
It's when you hold me that I start unfolding, and all I can say is, oh.